Welcome to another episode of the Energy Lab podcast. Today's guest is a very inspiring and successful leader, a highly respected expert in standardization with more than 35 years of experience. Nicolas Fleury is a senior advisor, a consultant, an executive coach, a mentor, independent member and a speaker. My organization was in a very difficult position. I had to lead the turnaround. What am I doing? How am I using my time? And then I became uh, the CEO of the organization. I wanted actually to be super fit from a cognitive point of view to take the best possible decision at any time. I didn't want to go burn out. Nicolas was the Secretary General and CEO of ISO, contributing to significantly global trade, economic, social and also environmental development. The link between elite sports and top management is very obvious. I discovered again uh, the beauty of having time for myself. It was a kind of a shock when I realized this. My excuse to be always busy, etc., was not, was not correct. Nicolas shares his journey of undertaking two years of wellness coaching, where he learned about key elements such as core understanding of general health, nutrition, energy, mental energy, biomechanics, sleep, recovery, and physical activities. There's a number of debates about the, the return to the office or, or not. 70% of the costs were linked to salaries. So basically people are the, the major investment. We are living in a period with lots of anxiety, developing empathy, creating this right environment. How do you measure this in, in terms of the return on investment? Uh, I think that the major problem in most companies is... Welcome Nicolas Fleury to the Energy Lab podcast. What's your superpower? Well, uh, I think my superpower is the capacity to focus. Uh, when I'm working and concentrating on things that I have to do, I can totally isolate myself, even if there is music or people around me. And it's like uh, I don't hear, uh, I have a nose consolation functionality, if you want, and <laughs> I, I can concentrate very, uh, very extensively. The integrated noise cancellation sounds fantastic. And <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> and today, yes. this is such a great quality and superpower because yes. we all struggle with focus. We are so much distracted from everything. And we think it's modern. But actually, I saw a documentary about like 100 years ago. There's still people had this kind of issue. So I think each time and each technology has the same similar issues, just in a different level. So your superpower exactly. is with no time, let's say. It's no yes. time barrier. It's always good. Exactly. No, and I think it's a very important one, and uh, people have to learn to uh, to focus. Maybe we are going to talk about this a little bit in the context of our conversation. Looking forward to it. Uh, yeah. My first question: I'm really curious about you sharing in which phase of your career and life you decided decided to get some well being coaching because this was the beginning of our chat. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm very curious to know more and share as well with, other, with the audience. Yes, actually, it was in 2017. I was 50 years old at the time. But please, it, this was not a middle age crisis. <laughs> uh, I was the number two in my organization, uh, in charge of the operations with a lot of work. I was having also many other responsibilities and roles, such as board members and president of various associations. I was doing politics and I was president of uh, the municipality council of the place where I was living. So I was quite busy. And uh, this was the context of my, my career and my life, actually. So this was a critical, critical time, but not, as you said, a midlife crisis. But it's still no. a good time to, to get help. Uh, what happens in particular? Or can you give us a little bit of context? Which yes. were the moving reasons or... What did you do uh, in terms of outcomes, which were the key learning? So a bit of mm. both, I would be great. Yes. So actually, my organization was in a very difficult position at the time, both financially, structurally, and internally with issues uh, such as unmotivated staff and burnouts. And uh, as I told you, I was having all these activities and in addition to that, uh, were coming these problems with my organizations. And uh, I was, uh, I had to lead the turnaround uh, to try to save from this uh, unfortunate situation. And this is what makes me reflect actually about, uh, uh, you know, what am I doing? 
how am I using my time, uh, what I'm doing in life, uh, what is the direction that I'm taking, am I actually the best person uh, with the best fit uh, to take care of this turnaround? And um, in particular, uh, in such circumstances, I was thinking that each and every decision I had to take to lead the turnaround and try to save the organization was potentially a life or death decision. And, uh, you know, in such circumstances, you have to decide very quickly. And again, uh, this makes me think about uh, how I was, how fit I was. I wanted actually to be super fit from a cognitive point of view to make sure that I was able to take the best possible decision at any time. And on the other side, with regards to all my work, I wanted also, I didn't want to go burn out considering the amount of work that was required and the amount of work that I was already doing, my many responsibilities, uh, and uh, knowing that there was not a lot left in the 24 hours that we are having in front of us. So I also knew that in the coming time, I would become the uh, CEO of the organization. And when I was reflecting about all this, uh, that is taking care of the turnaround, leading the turnaround, trying to make that the organization would survive and actually reach its goal, and that I would also become, at a certain point in time, the CEO of, uh, of the organization, uh, I was thinking about how fit, again, I could be. And my perspective has always been that becoming or being the CEO of an organization is to be like an athlete, is to train yourself like an athlete and be, being always fit to take the, the best decision again. So that's why I decided basically to work uh, with a company coaching Formula One drivers. Uh, this company was called Insta Performance. It still exists, by the way. And uh, uh, because for me, the link between elite sports and top management uh, was uh, very obvious in that particular context that uh, I was describing. And actually, the the metaphor we can use it as a symbol, right? Performance sport and uh, business. It's mm. uh, it's it's the best one. I cannot think of one that it's really meshing better because of the cognitive performance, the physical performance, and the connection between body and mind, and mm. the resilience you build. So I think. Uh, this served you a bit. And what about the outcomes? Like when you, you went through, a, if I remember correctly, a couple of years, right? You were continuously coached. So they really yeah. did a great job and you did with them to, to build something uh, that they would have leveraged your, your own uh, um, capabilities at the best. So which were the best outcomes? I know that probably mm. it's a long list, but if you yes. need to sum summarize and, and mention the highlights, what would you mention? Yes. Well, first, uh, I did two years of coaching uh, in a row, and I, I learned indeed immensely with Insight Performance. Uh, they have a methodology which is based on the holistic approach, which is called the circle of better life. And there are seven key elements that you, you work on, actually, together with uh, different coaches and experts. Uh, uh, the first thing is your core. Uh, it's about yourself, uh, who you are, uh, what do you want, and uh, are you in control of, of your life? General health, nutrition, mental energy, uh, biomechanics, sleep, recovery, and physical activities. Mm -hmm. So during these two years, I went through all these elements uh, to learn and develop strategies for myself, which would allow me to become that kind of super athlete in my, my positions. Uh, the priority for me, as I mentioned, was uh, mental uh, energy uh, to really develop uh, highly uh, cognitive performance. And I started with this element uh, after having worked uh, on the core. So uh, uh, what I learned, uh, the, the primary, I would say, uh, uh, learnings was first the focus. We talked about that. Uh, focus only and strictly on what brings value uh, to me, but also for the work that I'm doing for the organization, eliminate, eliminating all the rest that doesn't bring anything actually to me or to the organization, and uh, uh, trying to understand also how I could actually focus on those activities which I kept actually and that I, uh, that I choose to, uh, to focus on. The second thing is uh, I learned how sleep and nutrition uh, are actually fundamental to keep uh, high energy levels and how all those elements that I was mentioning are actually interrelated and impact on each other 
It's not just because you are just sleeping well uh, that things are going to uh, go into the magic and you are going to be a super performer. You need also to take care of your physical activity precisely, understand how uh, nutrition uh, helps you uh, being being fit and uh, bring you uh, the level of energy that, that you require. All these aspects are linked together, and I understood how to uh, to work on all of them to, to reach the maximum level of performance, if you want. I have now a thought running in my mind about all the CEOs, other people say, I don't have time. I don't have time, mm. you know, all the, the priori prioritize, whatever. How was it for you before doing this? this yes. Were you like already sensitive to this topic that you already had the seed in your mind or something mm. that you discover on your way? No, time is a very, is a very specific issue and a, one of the key issues also I hear. I, I discovered. First, as I mentioned, I was doing a lot of things and I was not realizing or counting the time I was spending on all these things. And I was just accumulating the activities during the day and I was usually left with three or four or five hours of sleep and that's it. And I was trying to be uh, to fit everything that I had to do in that little piece of time that we have in, in one day. And uh, it was problematic. I was in this kind of busyness things mm -hmm. without really having the capacity to understand uh, uh, if what I was doing and how I was spending time uh, was very useful. Uh, I love to read, for example. Let's take an example. I love to read. And in that particular context, I was not able to read anymore. And this was generating a, a lot of frustrations in a way. And, and so I felt in kind of uh, overwhelming situations And what I learned with, uh, with insights to really manage the time. And I started to measure everything. I'm still measuring everything that I'm doing every day on a constant basis. I'm using a, a software actually, which is keeping reports. And I know exactly where I'm, I'm focusing my time, reading, working, doing sports, doing this and that, recovering. So I know exactly how to, to spend my time. When I started actually to look at what is useful and not useful, what brings value and what doesn't bring value. I started to eliminate a lot of things. And, uh, and I discovered again, uh, the beauty of having time for myself. So take, get, getting out, if you want, from, from this business. And an interesting thing was, uh, I look at the same about my own activities at work, uh, together with the coaches, what, I did is that looking how I was spending my time in the organization for during the, the five days of the week, uh, actually, and uh, uh, what type of activities I, I was allocating my, my time. And I realized that uh, looking at all these various uh, uh, activities that I was having during the day, only, uh, I would say, one and a half day that I was spending in terms of time was really contributing to add value to the company. And so uh, 3.5 days was uh, spent in activities that didn't really bring value to the organization. And this was the kind, and I was, uh, you know, number two, and then I became uh, the CEO of the organization. And it was a kind of a shock when I realized this, because I was just uh, understanding that most of that, my time was spent on useless things. And that my excuse to be always busy, et cetera, was not, was not correct. And I think that this is one of the problems today that a lot of CEOs and, uh, and, and uh, leaders uh, are having. Uh, they don't really look at how they spend their time and if the way they spend their time is really bringing value to uh, what they want to achieve, to what they want to do. And they do not want us uh, when they realize maybe that uh, something does not, uh, I would say, contribute to add this value, they didn't take the time to simply decide to stop doing this. And, and this is very important. And that's another important thing that I did during the coaching. I decided really to stop systematically everything that was not bringing value to me as a person or to the organization in my context of my leader, uh, leader, leadership positions. In uh, specific actions, and, what were uh, the... What did you do? Like when you started to realize, so di did you start to cut off things or which were the, mm -hmm. do you have any strategies, any method, anything to help you? 
And yes, uh, the uh, uh, you see, uh, I, I think a very typical thing is that you you can observe in companies is that there there is a lot of meetings, and uh, you have a lot of meetings. You spend your time in meetings, and in the end, you don't have any time to do the, the very, I would say, uh, important stuff. Uh, you are incapable actually to find time to concentrate on on what you really have to pro- uh, to produce, basically. And so uh, when I was actually uh, looking at these 3.5 days uh, where I was spending time without bringing a lot of value to the organization, a lot of these things were due to interactions, meetings, or activities that uh, really were were not useful. And here, one of the very easy things to do is just to say, okay, let's stop having uh, uh, stop meetings So uh, and, and, and be very clear and be very honest also with the usefulness of the things that you are doing. Is that meeting, is that activity going really to bring value to you and to the organization? Is this really what you are expecting out of that? Can I do something very differently or can I reduce the time? So uh, we were, and that's, that's something which I think is very common to everyone. Uh, on, on the Outlook calendar, for example, you, you can book a meeting for half an hour, one hour. But if you want to book a meeting for 20 minutes, then uh, it doesn't work. So you have to force the thing. And basically everyone and, and my assistants also were used to book uh, meetings in my agenda of at least uh, you know half an hour or one hour when it was not useful. So being radical about this and deciding actually not to do what is not bringing value and, and, and to question everything was fundamental. I'm sure there will be so many employees or so, so many people that would wish themselves uh, a CEO with this approach because there is so much stress coming out of... W- many times it's not even realized that is exactly the mm. reason w- what you explain. Many times it's like in the subconscious and all that stress coming up from losing and spending time in a not, not an appropriate way that creates only additional uh, rush and push that doesn't bring anything yes. zero. Yes, so. exactly, exactly. I think we spend a lot of time, uh, you know, uh, without questioning how we spend that time. And uh, we tend to fill our days with a number of activities and uh, and, and we forget the essence, uh, the essence of things, uh, the most important uh, activities. One particular aspect, also, uh, just to take uh, another example, was uh, my activity in social media, uh, uh, and, and and one aspect is is that I'm sure. without looking at how you spend time, you don't have an idea of how much time you spend. Uh, I was quite active on, on Twitter at the time, uh, on uh, on LinkedIn, and this and that. And by measuring things, I was realizing that every day I was spending around three, three and a half hours on social media. And uh, this was outside the, uh, the working hours in the evenings, etc. So in addition to what I was, uh, I was doing, so looking this and there. And when you see, when you measured that suddenly you have spent three hours on something that doesn't bring a lot of value uh, or at least you see that you have spent three hours on this and that you start questioning, is it really necessary? Then you, 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 this comes as a shock and you really start thinking about what is the essence? What is the important? Is it really necessary to do that? Is there another way of managing my time and achieving what I need to achieve? That comes only by measuring. Otherwise, the perception of the time, especially if you talk about social media, it's gone mm, because the yes. many tools are done exactly for that so that you lose yes. the time perception and hours mm. go and go. Um, mm. Nicolas, I, um, I recall l- the linking point with your personal life at that time. You mentioned something like minimalism style and changing a lot of what was your daily life. Would you, would you mm. like to share something about it? That yes, uh, mini- minimalism for me uh, has been another important aspect uh, that I wanted to develop uh, when trying to uh, to increase my capacity to focus and have a strong capacity to uh, to focus. The idea with minimalism uh, was to get rid again of all unessential things and keep only the essential ones to achieve what I wanted to achieve. Again, we talk about keeping the essence. Uh, in terms of, of time, but you also have a lot of distractions, a lot of useless things when it comes to the things that you have uh, together with you or around you. 
So uh, when I thought about, uh, I wanted to increase my cognitive capacity and my capacity to focus, I came to, to the idea that I, I have to get rid of everything, all the things that are clearly useless and keep my mind busy for nothing. So uh, I got rid of uh, many things, and today uh, everything I own, except books, I have a lot of books, uh, like you, you can see, it's my passion, and uh, everything that I own fits in the trunk of my car. I decided to keep only two pair of jeans, uh, three white shirts, uh, so that I don't have to care about what you wear, and uh, things keep simple. Uh, so uh, I'm not distracted by how to, uh, to get dressed in the morning or at any moment in time. It's very easy. Uh, I started to live in a 17 square meter studio, uh, smaller than an hotel room, with nothing than just a bed and a little table, nothing on the walls, no television, no more news, no Netflix, no social media anymore, (laughs) all these things, really not to have any distraction, not to be distracted and to be able to focus on really the things that I wanted to do and, 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 and to achieve. One, one interesting, yes. It's please. like creating space in your mind while you are eliminating things that are not necessary, mm. right? I can kind of visualize it in that way. Create mm. that space it, that you need for something important. Exactly. And again, not to be distracted, uh, not to have things which could also uh, distract you from an emotional perspective. For example, the news is absorbing a lot of energy. It's generating a lot of anxiety uh, uh, for nothing uh, in terms of the benefits. This is what I list was the the, the case to me. Interestingly, what I started to find myself in this uh, little studio, I told you I wanted to find time to read again. And uh, so I started to uh, to buy again uh, books and to dive into books. And at the beginning, I just realized that I could not read more than two or three pages mm. of a book in a row without looking at my phone or my iPad. So in terms of the, the capacity to focus, I was very, very bad. So I was very far from, from being in this noise-canceling capacity uh, at the time. So, uh, uh, and, uh, and again... This is, this is an observation I did, and I started to make efforts to be able to create that capacity to, uh, to focus. And now I can read for two, three, five hours in one go without having to check a screen, for example, and just to stay uh, focused on, on, on the book. And, uh, and, and, and I'm happy with that. It's, it's, it makes a total difference. Wow, that's really amazing. We talk a lot about or we hear minimalism more or less. The concept is nice, everything. But actually, if we go to the essence, it's something that each of us should at least practice and try with because we are overwhelmed by things, information. And yeah, especially the news. I completely agree with you. Um, mm. I, I stopped like two years ago. I stopped reading the news because it was taking so much emotional energy and mm. so much headspace from things that I cannot change if I could or if you could I'm sure we will read news all the time but you cannot Uh, influence if you cannot influence and improve then why should you keep uh, that kind of uh, mental stress in in your mind that is keeping away power for something that you can influence you can improve and work at so I completely relate what you said and many people don't understand it like i i have it mm. a lot like really you don't listen to the, the news you don't read it i people think like you know outsider outside of the world like um for many people it's wrong but for me it's like the only mm. healthy thing i can do in terms of, uh, of mental energy yeah that's that's very mm. yeah uh going back to your role as ceo and the topic you mentioned about burnout prevention how, if you think now, uh, your, your perspective, your experience, how can a CEO deal with burnout prevention and also low productivity? Uh, which measures or which prevention measures you would suggest? You mentioned already some of them. Is there anything mm. else that you believe could be beneficial? Yes, I think that as a CEO, uh, the most important thing is to create the right environment for people, uh, listen to them and, and let, him, let them do their job. Uh, I think that the major problem in most companies is is the management styles. There is no clear sense of directions. Uh, there is a very command and control style of management. Very little autonomy given to employees. Uh, employees not included in the in the making of decisions. Uh, as I mentioned, we tend to fill days with endless meetings. 
making that people can only do their real job, I would say, in the early morning or late at night uh, through all the time. And, and sometimes, you know, we are the CEOs and you like to, uh, to enter into people's office or being in the middle of the, uh, the teams and just uh, disturbing them, keep, keeping interacting them, etc. Uh, we also have tools at work, like instant messages, uh, you know, the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, Microsoft instant messages or the WhatsApps or, or all these applications, which makes, and the notifications or screens, that, which makes that uh, people are constantly uh, disturbed. Uh, or we keep calling them, etc. We send emails at night during the week or on holidays. We multiply the number of projects or we give uh, unrealistic objectives. And this is what is creating actually uh, a high risk of, of burnout and, and reduce really the level of engagement of people in a company. So, uh, uh, and the lack of motivation and, and, and stress. So I think that uh, when you are a CEO, you need to understand this and, and you need to, uh, to change that to really give this environment where people can actually do the work for which they are paid. Do you think the unfortunately popular quiet quitting, I think it's the right term, is it something that has to do with it? Because it looks like a big percentage, I don't know, I was reading about more than 50% of people have already, mm. so to say, quitted their job in, in their mind. Has it something to do with this unrealistic way of, working and we always aim for work-life balance which is mm. really nice all in theory but today this balance with this 50 50 is not even you know cannot even think about it i don't know do you think this mm. quite quitting uh danger that in many companies we're seeing and many people unhappy with the work has to do with that would it stop it yeah Yes, I, I think so. I think that uh, COVID uh, has been also a, a, a revelation for a number of uh, employees, uh, a number of workers, uh, because they had to, to work from home. And, and they could realize that uh, uh, at some point they can organize themselves, they can manage also, in a, I would say, in a very productive way their days. Uh, they can, uh, uh, you know, distance themselves from these constant distractions. And at some point they had the, the, the possibility to concentrate and to focus on their job precisely. And they could compare probably this possibility to manage their theirs in a proper manner with what were uh, their times at, uh, at the office, where they were mm -hmm. constantly disturbed, where they were having this pressure that I was describing. And, uh, and at the same time, you see, uh, in the context of COVID, a number of companies had to reduce the number of projects, focus on small but very important type of projects. So again, this lighten a bit, a bit. I, I think the uh, the the uh, the, uh, the the level of, of mental pressure and, and the stress, and for people uh, realizing this, uh, thinking that they would go back to this environment where they would feel this pressure, this stress, these tensions uh, uh, would simply not be acceptable anymore. And this is why I think that it's very important for the leadership also to realize that there's a number of debates about the, the return to the office or, or not. I think uh, uh, you need to understand what is good and what is best for the organizations in terms of the way of working. And again, create that environment which is going to allow the company uh, to perform because it's all about also performance for the company and performance of the employees. The performance of the company directly uh, depends on the performance of, uh, of, the, of the employees. And so create this environment and understanding actually that what you may do at some point can be very detrimental to the mental health uh, of, and to the capacity of the employees to work is, is very important. I have to say that I, I don't really like the, the, the work-life balance because it's like, you know, you need to play with the weights and uh, uh, give a little bit more of this, give a little bit of more than that. And it's very difficult, if not impossible, to, uh, to, to manage. For me, I, I more like to talk about work-life harmony. One cannot be disconnected from the other. Uh, everything is, is really, you know, coming all together. And, and we need to create that harmony all together. And that harmony also uh, comes with uh, focusing on what is really important, uh, having the sense of directions and, and reduce this, this pressure and stress so that we can deliver the best, really. I love that you are saying it. I also 
changed my mind on the uh, work-life balance. We, Marcos is more, uh, one said, rhythm. And I like as well the idea, as well, um, balance. Because it's, uh, mm. again, this, this uh, ups and downs, this integration. It's not here ends work, here begins life. At least mm. not anymore and not in most of the, the, the work that we're talking about. Probably if you do, mm-hmm. if you are, I, I once talked to a bus driver, no, to a taxi driver in New York who was going to a business trip and he told me, you know, I couldn't do anything else because if I drive my taxi, I finish work, I finish and it's done. I don't think about it anymore. And, because and I was super yeah. stressed because I was traveling a lot. It was a lot going on in my, and I thought like, how lucky is this guy? Because yeah. in that case, probably you can talk about balance in terms of years end. And here begins my free time, mm-hmm. but it's not the case yeah. for most of us. So, uh, like your perspective mm. on on uh, uh, balance and harmony. Sorry, on harmony, work life, yes. work life harmony. Yeah. Um, in your experience, which factors have the biggest impact on employee well being at work? If you would sum it up, and you think like a few things to have the both internal and external, what does have the biggest impact? Yeah. Well, for me, again, it's uh, to implement the right management approach. And, and we need to understand uh, how the ways we manage our people, uh, we let the company, uh, is actually helping them uh, generating performance, uh, giving the best. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's fundamental. W- one thing is that uh, in the case of my organization, 70% of the costs were linked to salaries. So basically, people are the, the major investment. And what I want as, as the CEO is to maximize the return on this investment, obviously. And it's all about, again, the performance of the organization and the capacity in terms of uh, my leadership to generate sustainable high performance. One thing when we talk about uh, well-being in, in companies, and uh, uh, this relates maybe to the culture, maybe we can talk a, a little bit about that, is that well-being is not this kind of, you know, nice uh, uh, things to, to, to discuss about. It's about uh, the performance of the company and the capacity and the capability of the company to deliver what it is expected to, uh, to deliver. But to come back to your question, I think what is important also for, for a leader, for, for a CEO or for an executive is to be empathic, to understand how human being works. And this is what I learned also uh, doing my coaching with INSA. I understood uh, how actually my body uh, works and, and reacts when I'm fit to do certain type of activities, when I'm not fit to do other types of activities, and align actually the way I was working with the way uh, my body works and, and me as, as a human being works. And when you understand this, then you can also have approach which are very helpful and 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 uh, for for the employees because then you understand that they are human beings basically and you organize uh, the work the way of working um, in uh, in the way that fits with them uh, as human being and how their bodies and and and, and is working. Another thing is to understand that small steps are, are very important. This is what I learned also in, in terms of my coaching. They can make a huge difference and totally transform the, the company. So there is no need to make a, a revolution. But when you start actually to understand how human being works, doing small steps and, and rearranging a little bit the way you work can completely uh, can make a complete difference. If typically uh, you change the way of managing emails, uh, you change the way of uh, uh, organizing your your meetings and uh, what you are expecting from from your meetings, just looking at these two factors can change completely the atmosphere and the level of engagement in a company. Of course, the, the, in terms of the external factors, it's it's very difficult today because we are going through a, a quite a number of crises uh, due to the conflicts, the the, the economic situation. Uh, the sense of urgency that uh, climate change generates with uh, with people. So we are living in a period with lots of anxiety. Uh, and people can have also their own uh, personal problems, financial problems, family issues, illness, etc. So uh, there's a lot of uh, things from, from the outside world that can affect the employees' morale and, and mental health. I think that here also in your responsibility of, uh, of leaders, uh, you have to understand that these uh, can have 
these are factors get, that can have a, a big impact on, on people. And again, developing empathy and create an environment where uh, the their work is not uh, creating, adding, uh, I would say, uh, problems uh, to their already difficult situation, but creating this right environment where uh, they, they feel that uh, actually they can give the best of themselves can help a lot in this context also and can help mitigating uh, the negative impact of those uh, external factors. Yeah, I like that you mentioned the, the part related to empathy. I believe that today we are starting to talk more about as well emotional intelligence, empathy, and a different mm. way of style of management that probably were more typical in, in, in the past. But still, there is there is a lot to be done because uh, company culture plays a role. The, the training mm. that management has, the, the personality itself, there are so many variables. And even in good company, you wouldn't expect what sometimes uh, uh, can happen in terms of, uh, of the impact and then keeps people in the same company or they mm. them away. And this is something that has to do mm. a lot with the, another big topic, which is talent retention, right? Or acquisition exactly. first. <laughs> So I think that exactly. it's everything so interconnected that we cannot just talk about it in a separate way. You mentioned the word holistic, and I think that there is describe it very well. So all the mm. interconnection of, of those elements. Um, there is always a question that pops up when I think about or talk about those topics, and it's uh, the measurability of of some. Mm. You know, when you implement well being. Um, as you did for your company in your previous in your previous position, uh, your well-being mm. programs. Many times, uh, the you know which is the ROI rather than other metrics. Is it even possible, or does for me it doesn't make a lot of sense even to to measure because many times it's so difficult the complexity. What is your opinion mm. on this? Probably some questions that you also got like, how can I measure it so that I know the investment is worth their uh, effort? Mm. Yes. One thing, if you if you allow me, uh, we talk briefly about company culture, and and I think that this play a, a huge role because we tend to talk about well being programs, and when we talk about well being programs, it's considered like a kind of a side thing, uh, in uh, beside I would say the uh, you know the daily activities or project of the of the businesses etc. And it will make that usually, uh, because it's, it's beside, it's a program, it's something in addition to, uh, mm. businesses will tend to, uh, to forget about that. For me, uh, uh really well-being is, uh, is, is, is fundamental as part of the culture of a company. And it's, it's not about developing as such a culture of, of well-being. I think that there is always a, a confusion that it's not, you know, around the, the, the fruit, uh, uh, that are given to, to the employees, the meditations, or uh, there is this kind of assimilations to, to spa <laughs> at some point or something like that. And, uh, it, it's not about, uh, it, it's not about this. It's not about, uh, making people happy and then everyone is happy and that's it. Uh, her well-being is really um, is about developing a culture of high sustainable performance to help the company thrive and achieve its goals and take the steps to create that performance. And then it's not it becomes not a kind of an individual program as such, but this is going to be a holistic, as we discussed, approach to the way you manage the, the company. And I think this is this is very fundamental. And about the. Uh, Measuring things, uh, as you said, it's, it's basically the very first things that I'm asked precisely when I was talking about, uh, well-being in, in, in the company. We live in a world driven by data and we usually must be able to demonstrate that there is a, a measurable return on each and every, uh, investment. Again, as you said, uh, in terms of, uh, of well-being, this is challenging because there are a number of elements which are very difficult to capture. In my example, uh, I measured uh, the impact of my sleep and the lack of sleep on my cognitive performance through exercises for a certain period of time. And the results were very clear that when I was sleeping less than six hours, I was in a bad mood and much slower in the terms of my capacity to focus and think and solve problems. So I was doing this through, through very precise exercises, and this could be confirmed. So... Increasing my sleep pattern made me obviously a better leader and able to take better decisions and with a greater capacity to focus. But how do you measure that on the bottom line? 
How do you measure this in, in terms of the return on investment? Uh, we can measure speed, I think, in uh, the execution of projects. We can measure uh, the level of success of projects uh, within budget and deadlines. We can measure also a higher level of engagement of employees. Uh, this can be done through, through uh, surveys as well. We can observe less stick leave. Uh, we can observe uh, lower turnover, turnover, high staff retention, a capacity, as you mentioned, to attract talents, uh, uh, increase reputation of the company, and, and more satisfied customers. So I think that when you go through the way that I was describing in terms of creating that environment, in terms of adapting the management style, these areas will uh, see uh, a concrete benefits that you actually uh, can, can measure. But beyond this, for me, I would like to say that well-being of employees and the impact of the performance basically should be a no-brainer. It's a question of common sense. And when you make people comfortable and you trust them, you give them autonomy, uh, you allow them to work, uh, uh, you allow you allow them to uh, give what they are really capable to give for the company, obviously, you are going to uh, get better results. So you are going to be much more performing and you will be able to better achieve your, your objectives. So uh, for me, it's, it's, it's all obvious, and this should be a no-brainer for, for everyone. Yeah, common sense. A good mm, common exactly. sense and no-brainer. <laughs> mm, yes. Um, <laughs> you remind me of the importance of giving the example, because the problem mm. is the question that I asked you before is one thing by side, and mm. uh, great that you pointed out because it can be misunderstood. It's about living it, right? When you talk about culture, it's about values. So it should be mm -hmm. one value. How relevant is that the, the CEO or anyway, the management lives those because when we talk about culture, it's not like it's written somewhere and you need to learn it by heart. And then suddenly everybody is in the right culture. But how important is for well-being mm. having leadership? Going yeah. first is but, it something that yeah, is it even possible without leadership going first, having this yeah. culture? Well, good yeah. question. Uh, uh, my perception, uh, my point of view is no. Uh, if we want to have a, a long-term sustainable impact, uh, the CEO needs to be involved. The leadership team needs to be involved, and uh, they should be the first. I would say to understand and deploy what they think is good for the organization. It's it's really about uh, leading by by example. I think my case was uh, was uh, the confirmation of that. I first went through the experience. I was experimenting a lot of things, and then I was sharing the outcomes of the, these experience and the outcomes uh, with uh, with the staff. They could also see the impact of what I was doing on, on myself and on the, the rest of the uh, the organization, the the atmosphere, uh, the way of working, the the, the environment. So I think it's, it's, it's indispensable if we want, again, to have long-term sustainable impacts. And we are going to have amazing results if really the, the, the leadership is, is playing the, the game and shows the example. On the contrary, don't expect anything good if you promote employee well-being and you keep sending emails at two in the morning or during the weeks or you bother your staff the, during the holidays where they have to recover. Um, so uh, this is never going to work. And people are not going to believe what you are doing. People are not going to believe what you are trying to achieve or tell them. So it's uh, for me, it's a fundamental aspect. Leadership involvement, and you should be the first one to uh, actually implement and demonstrate the benefits of what you want to implement. Yeah, without walking the talk, I think that you cannot influence anyone because this is the you talk about influencing this is like the only one thing that really makes sense you need to give the first example and then be there as a leader exactly. in that, that sense exactly serving the others and giving the example not telling what to do because you uh, were told so from someone else that it's healthy to do or that it's good to do that is profit increases profitability and who knows what else so i think that's mm. maybe about living it uh, anything in particular? I mean, it's already a lot that you've been sharing with your experience, your knowledge. It's it's a lot to ponder of and, and reflect on. Is there anything else that you believe could be helpful or inspiration? Anything that you would like to add before saying goodbye? Yeah. Well, uh, again, I think that uh, uh, what you are doing, uh, you and Marcus, uh, are very inspiring. And uh, these covers, uh, uh, the elements that 
uh, people can reflect on and try to work on to to really uh, bring this uh, this value for for the organization. And uh, for me, the being curious, uh, understand, trying to understand how people do work and do function. How can we also uh, work on ourselves? Uh, self-reflect on the way we do things, on the value that we bring, uh, is something uh, fundamental. And, and the thing that I would like to to say is beyond the work, uh, beyond your role as uh, as a CEO. And here I have actually uh, presented my case and my experience to uh, at a number of occasions to to, to CEOs. What I could see also to a certain extent is that. Uh, themselves, uh, you know, are not really en- enjoying what they are doing and themselves feels that that's a certain point in time, uh, you know, uh, what is the reason uh, why I'm doing that, where am I going and who I am and what am I expecting from, from, from life and taking the time really to, uh, to step back and understand this, self-reflect and work simply for ourselves will improve yourself as a person will help you and make you discover things which are incredible about your competencies and your capacity. And when you leave that and then you share this uh, with your people, with your surroundings, with uh, your family and and your people working with you, then you will get a lot of uh, incredible benefits and you will contribute, uh, obviously, to uh, something much better than you can think you can contribute. So it's in both aspects of life and business, extra because we cannot separate it, and it's exactly in line with the harmony you were mm. talking about. Great. Thank you very exactly. much for sharing this, this last thought, which I believe it's uh, underestimated. And maybe the extra incentive or motivation for those who are thinking about making a change for, for organization for themselves and, and looking for the, that extra drop. Mm. Thank you very much. Where people, what do people can connect with you, uh, Nicolas? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I have my own website, uh, nicolafleury.ch. Uh, there is an, an email there, uh, info at uh, nicolafleury.ch. Uh, so that's the best way. Or on LinkedIn, I would be very happy also to uh, uh, accept your invitation on LinkedIn. If you send me an email there, it's going to be also uh, okay. I will appreciate that. I will add the links in the comments in the description. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so Nicolas. much. Thanks to you. It has been a pleasure and looking forward to talk to you soon again. Katie, yeah. many thanks to you and all the best. And uh, I wish you all the possible success as well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.